there we go. It's not going to be shared super widely just with RPE folks. So if, again, anyone wasn't able to make it and is interested in listening back, they're able to. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Allison Tombros Corman. I am the Senior Director of Culture of Respect here at NASPA. Um, I've been with Culture of Respect basically uh, since it was formed back in uh, 2014 or so. And um, I've had the pleasure of getting to speak with some of you. Um, but looking forward to meeting uh, many more of you. So before we get started, I might ask um, if folks don't mind um, muting themselves on their end, we're getting a little bit of um, background noise. Um, so if you don't mind going ahead and hitting mute on your end, we greatly um, appreciate it. And um, hopefully we'll be able to take everybody off mute uh, at the end. So if in case we have uh, questions or discussion, um, Jennifer, is that us? Beeping in the recording? Nope, I don't think so. Okay, I think we got that. All right, I was like, that would, might be a new thing that Ring Central does is beep all through the recording, but that doesn't seem like a great choice <laughs> in their software. All right, well, thanks everybody so much again for, for joining us. We are so glad to have you here. So um, as Jennifer mentioned, we're gonna talk to you a little bit today um, about the Culture of Respect Collective, which is the signature program that Culture of Respect runs, and talk a little bit specifically about the ways in which um, this program has worked um, really well and um, really effectively with the RPE program. So that's why I think Jennifer and I are particularly excited to chat with you all today. We've had um, some phenomenal experiences with your colleagues in the state of Montana, the state of Rhode Island. Um, they were kind enough to join us on the phone today so um, that they can share their perspective if, um, if they feel um, moved to do so. But we really are excited to, to talk a little bit about the ways in which the collective um, and RPE work so well together. So we're going to talk a little bit about this kind of current landscape, this moment that we're in in time. We'll tell you a little bit about culture of respect and then specifically more about the collective. And we will leave time at the end for questions and next steps. But um, again, I think Jennifer and I both think of this as a fairly um, informal discussion more than anything else. And so if you do have questions that come up during um, our you know, kind of more formal, so to speak, presentation, please go ahead and pop those in the chat and we will um, either save them for the end or if we can, we'll just address them there in the moment as they come along. So um, that should kind of lay things out. So I think nothing on this on this slide is going to come as a surprise to any of you on this call, but it, it bears, um, you know, just taking a moment to take stock of where we are um, in the larger landscape of higher education and um, nationally. I'm sure many of you are aware that the new Title IX regulations came down from the Department of Education um, just about a month ago, um, so May 2020, and um, there is a lot in there for institutions of higher education to digest and figure out very, very very quickly as they move towards the August 14th implementation deadline. Obviously, we are in a huge and ever-evolving moment when it comes to equity, inclusion, racial justice, and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, again, not that this is new by any means, but I think um, that it comes as no surprise to anyone here um, that there is kind of um, a new a new moment in time when it comes to this work of people being engaged and seeing really the intersection of these issues in their personal lives um, and hopefully in their professional lives as well. And last but not least, um, we are all still very much dealing with the COVID pandemic and trying to figure out what a new normal looks like um, in all of the various facets of our lives, whether that's in our personal lives and in schools, um, K to 12, be it with, with folks in our families, um, in our work with institutions of higher education, what have you. So all of, you know, all of these different um, facets of trying to figure out what a new normal looks like. So for our college and university partners, um, who we'll speak a little bit more about uh, later in, in this discussion, um, but they have just a ton of challenges that they are up against right now. Um, I'm sure y'all have read, have read the articles about, you know, and seen and experienced, you know, this, this stretching of capacity, just the fact that there is just so much work to be done as we try to navigate this um, coronavirus pandemic, um, as well as all of these other intersecting events, and there's just not enough capacity um, to go around, whether that is people's bandwidth, um, folks on furloughs in various places, people who might otherwise be tasked um, with other work, jumping in to, to work on any of these issues on the left here. So limited capacity, limited resources, and this upcoming um, implementation deadline when it comes to the Title IX work. 
And I just want to also take a moment and recognize Jennifer and I have been talking a lot about this um, in our in our work and culture of respect, just the way in which sexual violence really sits at kind of um, the intersection of all of these um, and all of these different issues. So I know um, so many are, of us are familiar with the ways in which um, you know sexual violence has been used um, as a as a tool and a mechanism of control when it comes to communities of color, particularly um, you know. A, a black and brown people. And so this idea that you would be um, looking at this intersection of sexual violence and racism and racial justice, racial injustice, excuse me, um, is certainly not new uh, to, to anyone. Um, we're also thinking about um, Title IX. We've made so much progress over the last couple of years in really raising the profile of sexual violence um, in institutions of higher education. And we don't wanna see this new rule result in any kind of backsliding or loss of ground. And lastly, we have, again, this intersection with COVID-19 um, things that we might be seeing present in one way in colleges and universities, um, students who are engaging with um, sexual violence, maybe uh, in an on-campus setting, um, maybe seeing that move more beyond behind closed doors. Um, more, I've, I've certainly um, seen data, and we've spoken anecdotally with folks who are um, engaging a lot more on this from an inter in an interpersonal violence perspective, um, and may not be able to connect with people and provide services and resources in person in a way that they might normally be doing so in a non-COVID era. So just um, wanted to let you know that that's something that we're certainly thinking about and infusing into all the work we do. And um, I hope that we have time at the end for conversation because I'd really love to hear more about how you all see these intersections playing out in your work as well. Um, so with that, we're gonna talk a little bit about culture of respect. Oh, sorry, Jennifer, this is still me. <laughs> you want me to take this? I'm so sorry. So um, just um, very simply put, sorry, y'all, I apologize. We've been doing a couple of these and sometimes we trade back and forth and sometimes we don't, but that's on me. Um, so the uh, mission of Culture of Respect is to build the capacity of educational institutions to end sexual violence through ongoing expansive organizational change. And I know that that's a lot of um, really buzzy words and we're gonna kind of break those down um, into what they really mean um, in terms of actual work on the ground. But I do wanna highlight a couple of things in, in that mission statement. Um, when we talk about capacity of educational institutions, most of our work in Culture of Respect um, really deals with colleges and universities, but not exclusively. We have also been working with um, K-12 entities uh, for really the last um, five or so years. And I'm gonna highlight a little bit of that work uh, a little bit later on. And the ongoing expansive organizational change piece is our way of um, really letting institutions know that we are here to do the um, overarching, long running systemic organizational change work. It is the work that is um, slow and steady and takes a long time to get there. But seeing as how um, a lot of things right now are, are kind of up for re-examination and, and rethinking and retooling, this is as a good a time as any to be rethinking um, large scale organizational change for educational institutions. So these are uh, a couple of principles that ground really everything cu uh, culture of respect does. One is a public health framework, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through telling you about this program. But um, Jennifer and I both come from public health backgrounds, and um, Jennifer, a social work background, and we really believe in the importance of using public health approaches to address the issue of sexual violence. So we bring to our work evidence-based approaches um, where those exist, and in the absence of evidence-based approaches, certainly promising and emerging practices. And really Really, we come from this philosophy of bringing everyone to the table to be part of this work. Um, it just can't be, nor should it be, the responsibility of just one individual on a college or university campus or a K-12 system to try to take on addressing sexual violence all on their own. Um, it's just not feasible, nor is it really appropriate for that to be up to just one person. Um, hopefully, we all agree that this is uh, the work of, of all of us to, to make these changes happen. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our signature tools, um, just because these will come up again later in our discussion. So the image that you're looking at um, on your left, assuming that nothing is getting flipped around, I don't think so, I think it should be on your left, is the core blueprint icon. And that is um, 
however you want to describe it, kind of a spoken wheel or um, a snowflake, whatever it looks like to you. But what's really important about this imagery is that these are our six pillars. These are our six areas in which we really help colleges and universities and educational institutions focus their work on sexual violence prevention and response. Um, it is so important that institutions have things like clear policies and that they're doing evidence-based prevention for everyone on campus, but that um, just can't be all of the things that are happening. There are really these six areas in which colleges and universities and educational institutions need to be focused if they're going to make comprehensive change. So the core blueprint is the culture of respect framework for thinking about sexual violence and ending se sexual violence, but it's also um, an actual tangible thing. The core blueprint is about a 75 page um, guide that any institution or any individual can download for free from the Culture of Respect website. Um, and it really is a compendium of best practices organized around these six areas. Now I will say with a small caveat that we have been waiting a long time to do an update to the core blueprint because um, we've been waiting to see what was going to happen with the um, Title IX guidance. There were multiple points across the last couple of years where we said, gosh, we really want to do an update to this core blueprint, but um, wanted to wait and see what was going to happen with this Title IX rule before we did such a large undertaking. And so, um, um, you know, there's lots of amazing evergreen content in there, grounded in best practices that will not change, but the uh, information on Title IX rule um, is in need of a quick overhaul. But we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the resources we have kind of readily at our disposal um, or that are coming very, very soon to help you navigate that. So the companion to the core blueprint is the core evaluation, and that is a really rigorous self-assessment instrument. It's about 150 questions long, organized around each of these six areas, and, help, and helps institutions um, basically take stock, take inventory of what they're doing um, around these six areas and the extent to which their practices, policies, and procedures align with those six areas. So um, Jennifer's going to talk a little bit more about the core evaluation further on. I just wanted to kind of tee that up for y'all. So we'll also talk a little bit about the prevention the prevention programming matrix. If you haven't visited this already, I highly encourage you um, to check it out or to share it with uh, folks in your field. This is a free resource on our website and it is really a clearinghouse of evidence-based or um, based in promising or emerging um, evidence uh, prevention education programs. These are the programs that are kind of widely available across the country, um, things that you might see being used at a lot of campuses. And each of them um, has a deep detail page which talks about the level of evidence to support um, the effectiveness of the program, kind of its theoretical basis, who's using it, um, how it's the, the doses and how it's administered, um, and you can kind of um, filter by the level of evidence you're looking for, the format, whether online, in-person workshop. Obviously, we have a lot of attention right now focused towards those online prevention programs given the moment we're in with COVID. Um, but you can also filter by the audience, whether it's faculty, staff, graduate, undergraduate, etc. So this is one of the most frequently accessed web uh, pages on our website, and I definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, Jennifer and I will pop links to this directly to this in the, in the chat in just a second. Foundations is something brand new that we have um, just kind of shared with the field. Foundations is a self-paced course. It's made of six modules, and it is really designed for um, someone who doesn't spend their day um, in and out doing sexual violence prevention and response work. It's meant to be a tool that can be used to help um, build allyship in this work. We know that there are so many um, departments and silos on college and university campuses, as well as in the K-12 K space, who may touch just a little bit on sexual violence. They know they may be a mandated reporter or they understand that this is work that is happening, but they don't really understand kind of, um, you know, what the basic tenets of this are, why people throw around language like trauma-informed response or survivor-centered or things like that. So for folks who are looking to um, build up their bench of allies, the Foundations course is an amazing way to do that. It's a self-paced course, so perfect for something when you're kind of um, in this time of a lot of online professional development and learning. So um, that is something that is newly available through Culture of Respect. I'm going to start. Stop talking. I have talked long enough. I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer and she's going to tell you all about the collective. I'm also going to give a little caveat. My cat really likes when I start talking like this, so it is possible you will see a tail smacking my face in just a few short minutes. <laughs> all right. So as I mentioned at the beginning, my name is Jennifer Hinkle. I am the program manager for the collective. 
The Collective is a two-year program uh, that brings together institutions of higher education who are dedicated to ending campus sexual violence, and we guide them through a rigorous process of self-assessment and targeted organizational change. As you see on the screen, right? Um, we work with a very diverse group of institutions, and each cohort relies on that expert developed public health framework that we were talking about, cross campus collaboration through that multi stakeholder approach, and peer led learning to make meaningful programmatic and policy changes. Participating institutions receive strategic support and technical assistance throughout the process, as well as detailed documentation of campus initiated changes that support survivors, prevent sexual violence, and communicate that violence is unacceptable. So how do we do that? We work with institutions here at the beginning. Um, and right now we are at nearly 120 and our cohort three, we're currently on cohort four in the first year with them. In cohort three, who is now going through the second year of the program, we've got a couple of schools from Mexico. We've had schools in Canada. Um, we're excited to be talking to some institutions outside of North America as well and really excited at the prospect of possibly going even more internationally with this program. Um, but again, all over the country and you'll see particularly in cohort four, really targeted in Montana right now because of the work we've been doing with Patrick. So what we do with each institution is start with that core evaluation. We do a baseline core evaluation and then an endpoint evaluation so that we can really assess what has changed and what work has been done over that two, per two year period. When we say rigorous, we mean rigorous. It does take a good amount of time. Um, we're actually, I think we're hitting close to 200 questions at this point. And with the new Title IX rules, it's going to increase next year because we work in compliance as well as looking at what is that emerging practice, that best practice for schools to be implementing these policies and prevention efforts. And then based on that core evaluation, we work with them to complete a customized plan, which we call their Individualized Implementation Plan, or IIP, which is that a, a list of SMART goals that we work with them to make sure are clear, are achievable, and we make sure that they are delegated across the campus leadership team and not just one person, hopefully, doing this work. And these are the things that we look and measure at how many have been achieved over the year or the two year period. Um, the first time that they do it, it's just a draft. And again, we work with them to finesse it and make it work for them uh, before that's finalized. And all of this is done by really keeping in mind that social ecological model of things. So as a social worker, something I heard constantly <laughs> throughout my master's program is the importance of looking at all of these issues within this larger context. We've got human beings, we've got students here on this individual level, and we've got other, we've got employees as well, which is a, a focus of the program, not just students. And pulling it all the way out to our adopted version, which shows the institution of higher education and the importance of that upstream prevention to really permeate throughout all of these um, let's see, I just had a question for Alec, like maybe one second. Okay, there we go. Um, to, but to permeate throughout the layers so that we can really make effective and lasting change. Something that's also been really important to us and something I'd like to eventually adopt this, our model to really include is that piece of structural and historical levels of the framework that aren't formally a part of the social ecological model, but some really great work that's been done by Farah Tanis of the Black Women's Blueprint is really looking at the history of sexual violence and the roots of sexual violence in racism and colonialism within the history of particularly this country. So that's something that when we're working with institutions, we really highlight and is integrated in every piece of the work we do. Something that's really exciting in how we do this work with our institutions and some evidence that recently came out um, is from cohort four institutions. So far before they joined us, because they only joined in January, they were working, some folks over there in, uh, I think the sociology department, <clears throat> excuse me, were working on a, some grant funded research looking at um, 
sexual violence task forces at institutions of higher education. And so what they found really supports our foundation of what we do and how we approach this work from that multi-stakeholder approach. So some barriers that they identified in these sexual violence task forces being effective were a limited capacity, lack of knowledge, limited student engagement, and bureaucratic structure. And then some facilitators were positive campus culture and pre-existing programming. So when we come in, those are already integrated into each piece of what we do. That limited capacity, we work with them to help through that multi-stakeholder approach and through developing that CLT so that hopefully we're spreading some of that work a little bit further, as well as training certified peer educators on your campus so that hopefully they can help in taking some of that work off of some of your professionals. Um, we've got ongoing professional development opportunities. We are very strong proponents of student engagement. That's something that we, uh, our institutions will always follow through on <laughs> as we persist. That, uh, the importance of it. Um, and again, that positive campus culture isn't always something that we can we can influence, but it's something that we work to help influence through just promoting their dedication to being a part of culture of respect in the collective. So some individual or some of the more specific program components are that public commitment, uh, that self-assessment, engaging in peer-led learning, so our roundtables that we do every other month to really engage folks throughout all of our cohorts, so from cohort one all the way through now cohort four, ongoing professional development, and then evidence-based decision-making and technical assistance, looking at research context and experience. Something I wanted to outline more specifically though, as how we're doing this with, I'm going to call you out, Patrick, looking at you right now because thankfully we're in camera. Um, but this is how we've been doing it with Montana. So looking at our deliverables, Culture of Respect doesn't have any, we do have our firm deliverables through our core evaluation and the IIP and the development of the CLT. Um, but how we've worked with, or how Patrick and Montana have worked with us is developing these parallel deliverables to really support both the components of the grant and the importance of this work, as well as not creating any additional um, barriers or any additional challenges or workload for the institutions who are taking part. So establishing that leadership team, administering the core evaluation, um, sorry, a computer gave me a wrong alert. Implementing that IIP, attending an ASPA strategies conference, which is something that's offered as one of the benefits through culture of respect, and participating in that ongoing professional development, parallel learning and technical assistance, all things that we provide ongoing documentation of, um, and we can provide to you specifically as an RPE director, or we can work with schools to help them provide that to you in a clear and um, concise way. This is our timeline and what it will look like for cohort four. It looks a little different for our current cohorts because we've had to adjust things for COVID. And we're absolutely flexible because we know things happen with institutions and with the world. Um, and so it's not set in stone if someone isn't able to get something by the end of spring 2021 and they aren't able to administer that core evaluation. But launching in January of that first year and developing that campus leadership team, doing a lot of learning and online modules to help them in identifying the right folks to be a part of it. If they already have a leadership team, how do they um, either grow that team or finesse it so that it meets their needs and is uh, multidisciplinary. Administering the core evaluation in spring, it takes multiple hours, so that one can take a little bit longer for folks to complete. Then starting by developing that individualized implementation plan, setting it back for some feedback and revision, and then that next year. So that's all that first year is a lot of planning, which is why it can also be really good for folks doing the OVW campus uh, programs grant because it's really, it, it aligns a lot with that planning phase of things. Um, but that whole entire second year is all about implementation and providing that ongoing professional development, parallel learning opportunities, technical assistance through whatever it is that institutions need. 
that IIP is a living, breathing document. And so absolutely, we expect to see it change and, and hope to see it change. And often hear from institutions at the end of their two years that, oh my gosh, we realize there are all these other things that we could be doing that we didn't think of at the beginning. Um, but through engaging in this program and through all of these other opportunities provided by the program, we understand now how much more work there is that we can really do. So in thinking about those outcomes and the impact, I'm gonna turn it over to Allie. Great, thank you. We had a couple questions come in in the chat and, and privately, so I just wanted to say um, for everybody's benefit, and if you're wondering if the slides and the recording will be available, absolutely yes, we can make sure that you get those. Um, if you are waiting with bated breath to figure out how to get institutions um, in your state involved with this program, don't worry, that part is coming as well. And, um, We'll make sure that we, uh, again, leave time to answer any question, any additional questions that you may have. So we do want to talk a little bit about outcomes and impact because obviously um, we want institutions to be um, finding, not just finding this program useful and feeling satisfied with it, but actually showing that it is doing something to move the needle at their, at their institutions. And so that's where this gets really, really exciting, um, where we can start looking at the data from cohorts one and two who have completely finished the program um, and start crunching those numbers. We are looking to put out a report a little bit later this fall um, that really looks at that, that data um, in more detail detail, but we can share with you a little bit of early um, outcomes data here, so that's fun. Um, so just generally speaking, in very broad strokes, you know, we saw institutions who went through this program feel like they had greater clarity and visibility about their institutional commitment to addressing sexual violence, as well as an increased awareness of what their institution's approach to actually doing this work was. Um, increased collaboration across departments. I think that the siloing, um, whether it's at an institution of education or really anywhere, um, is no surprise to anyone. And so, uh, you know, helping to build those relationships and to Jennifer's point about the, uh, the research that was done at, at um, uh, University of Kansas, you know, that's what we're here to help do is to help build some of that collaboration um, and cross department working together. Um, a greater sense of accountability. So we're here to gently um, keep people on track and hold them accountable for their work. Everybody um, needs a little bit of that help and accountability. Um, and also an increased sense of purpose and connection to this work. And um, we're very glad to see that people felt like they had a better sense of what the best practices were and the knowledge and skills to actually implement them since that is so core to the, to the, you know, the work of the program. So what we saw really at the end of cohorts one and two is that um, compared to baseline, core evaluation endpoint scores increased in five of the six pillars on, this is all on average um, for institutions. So five of the six pillars, um, their scores went up and aggregate those scores went up by about 50 points. Now I know that's kind of a hard number to wrap your head around because it's a little bit, you know, 50 what, 50 degrees, 50 points, but um, when you have the core evaluation report in front of you and you can see kind of where your institution was when you started and you see that number go up across five or six pillars um, and go up by 50 points, it really is reflective of the intentional and also organic change that institutions um, are working. And yes, I can absolutely slow down. Sorry about that. Yes. I was also going to mention that the core evaluation is also free available on our website for any institution institution or you all to download. So if you want to get an idea, the scoring isn't necessarily in there because we do a little bit of individualized scoring um, based on a number of different factors, but that might help give you a clearer idea of where some of those points are coming from. Yes, and I apologize. I'm a New Yorker originally, and sometimes I just get going and I'm really going. So thank you for, for asking. Um, we also found that institutions were on average um, compliant with three additional federal requirements. The um, core evaluation report itself has a series of checklists, one of um, federally required um, actions and policy statements and things like that, and one of recommended. And so we saw that by the end, institutions were on average um, checking three more boxes on that federally compliant list um, than they were in the beginning. And I think most kind of exciting to us is that, um, you know, Jennifer mentioned this individualized implementation plan where institutions create objectives that are meaningful to them about doing this work. On average, they identified 22 objectives, and by the end of the program, they completed or made progress on 85% of those. So those look different for each institution. You know, we're not here to be prescriptive and say, this is what you need to do at your institution. We're here to help um, guide institutions and help you figure out, well, what do we need to be doing here, and how can we get 
um, to a place where we can say, yes, we are now we are now doing this, or our policy statement now includes this, or we now offer this service or this program. So we do have some um, satisfaction data to share with you all. This is, um, uh, again, kind of early back of the envelope outcome data. Um, the report that we will be um, offering a little later on this fall makes this a little, uh, offers this in a little more depth, but it does show that folks were um, really, really happy with the support that they got through the program, whether it was the feedback they got or the technical assistance, be it um, kind of structured um, through, you know, structured learning environment or just ad hoc which is a really fancy way of saying that it is our job to be um, kind of on call for these institutions, um, to pick up the phone when they call, to answer their emails when they have them, and say, you have this question. Um, we either know the answer or we're gonna go out and find it for you. And folks felt like that was um, really efficacious in terms of making um, individual and institutional changes happen on their campus. They were able to identify areas for growth. Um, they were able to help define what they wanted to see change in that IIP and be able to, um, you know, through some professional development with us, have increased knowledge and skills as well as that accountability. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer um, to talk um, what participation looks like. Yeah, so to talk a little bit about our current or um, participants to date. So as I said before, nearly 120 institutions of higher education. We've worked with a number of community colleges and continue to do so. Uh, historically black colleges and universities, public and private four-year institutions, those that are religiously affiliated and system-wide institutions. It's important to us to ensure that we connect these schools as well to one another for that collaboration because like Ali was saying with the IIP it's incredibly important to meet schools where they are and to help them with their unique challenges that ultimately others are probably also facing to some extent so by connecting folks who have shared perspectives it can be incredibly helpful. Um, and you'll see on the screen, uh, or on the screen currently, is a map of our institutions to date. I'll let Ali talk a little bit more about our K-12 initiatives. Yeah, so K-12 is really, really interesting work for us. Um, I think that we are um, really excited about the ways in which we have successfully adapted this program, this collective program um, for K-12 spaces. Um, we've done it in a couple of different ways and we were actually asked to do this by a um, private K-12, uh, well technically a 9 to 12 all women's boarding school. Um, they had a connection to culture of respect and really um, felt like what the collective had to offer to higher education um, could work for them and asked us, well, would you be willing to make a version of the core evaluation that was specifically designed for us? Um, and so we did, and we implemented um, this program. Um, we have been working with that institution for five years. Um, they finished their kind of collective official program um, after two years, two and a half years, kind of in line with the way higher ed did it. And then they wanted to stay on and to continue to work with culture of respect because they felt like once the door had kind of been open to them about all the ways that they could be doing this work, um, kind of above and beyond just, just the bare minimum, they wanted to keep going. So um, I think we're now in, in year five or so of working with them, four or five. Um, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful partnership. Um, once we got out that we were working with them, we got an inquiry from a K-12 public school district um, for the same type of thing. So we then adopted the core evaluation even further, um, taking it from a 9 to 12 um, all-women's boarding school scenario, which looked and felt a lot like um, maybe a traditional four-year college campus in a lot of ways, residence halls and living on campus, um, but we adopted it for this K-12 public school district. And they went through the same process. They took the baseline self-assessment, um, made a plan, worked with us to implement it, and then reassessed. And it was really um, exciting and wonderful to be able to work with a K-12 institution or K-12 system um, because they had so much opportunity to reach students not just in four years, but in that whole spectrum of um, kindergartner to heading off to college. And they were really able to think about all the ways in which they had opportunities um, to engage with parents, to engage with families, to engage with students, faculty, staff, um, all along that trajectory. So um, 
I want to, I just bring that up to share that um, this is absolutely something that can and has been adopted in a K-12 space. And um, we think there are some really exciting opportunities here to, um, you know, not just bring this to just the colleges and universities in your state or just the higher, the, excuse me, the K-12 systems, but maybe even to think about what it looks like if you are um, bringing this in um, really from that gamut from, from kindergarten all the way through college and university. You know, what might that look like and what might you be able to, um, to assess and figure out in terms of how you're really able to make some, some long-term meaningful change if you, if you come at it from that perspective. And you'll see me as you talk about this stuff. Like I just, I'm so passionate about this and so excited that the idea of that is thrilling to me. <laughs> uh, I get a little emotional. All right, so I wanted to share with you just because if you're anything like me, the anecdotal, yes, data is great, but sometimes it's nice to hear some of that anecdotal um, perspective. So we reached out to a couple of institutions who have been a part of the RPE program and done uh, the collective through that. So Dr. James Campbell at Providence College said that the Culture of Respect Collective at Providence College brought wide engagement across the campus. Faculty, staff, and students working hard together to address sexual assault. In addition to the outcomes, we are implementing the process itself built greater trust and collaboration in our campus community. Working with NASPA, our state health department, and local crisis center infused the experience with both expertise and credibility. And the collective has been a highly beneficial experience for our campus community. Also reached out to someone that I'm not sure if many of you all know. So Kelly Parsley is currently the chair for health sciences at Carroll College, but in a former life had has worked as an RPE director. So she's got a really great perspective of both sides of this work um, and, and doing it the way that we're doing it. Um, so you'll see on the screen just a little bit from Kelly talking about the program, but Patrick, would you mind speaking a little bit, um, and, and Jeff speaking a little bit about y'all's, your, I was about to say y'all's, who I'm Southern, <laughs> perspective and experience in the program? Um, yeah, so I, some of you have kind of met me over this virtual platform before. Um, I've only started this position last October, but since then I've gotten some really, really good feedback from the institutions here in Montana who really enjoy the program, found it really beneficial. Um, Kelly actually used to have my position here. That's why I know she's so great. Um, and she's been really engaged in it the whole time. And she's been um, really good ear um, for me, or she's been a good resource for me to reach out to, to kind of understand as I come into this position, much more from that institution background. Um, so I can try to answer maybe some more specific questions if if you want to guide me on that. But yeah, overall, um, I've been really, really pleased with uh, the culture of respect and have had really good um, input from just about everybody in Montana that's gone through it, so, or is currently in it. So enough that I, we're, uh, we're looking at adding more institutions to this new cohort now, um, and also exploring the K through 12 too, so yeah. How's that? Sure. This is, uh, <laughs> Patrick. This is Jeff in Rhode Island. Um, I was a 12-year or 10-year member of NASPO before coming on to public health. And so having lived in student affairs, um, had a great deal of trust in the programs that NASPO was providing uh, and had provided to professionals um, like me uh, as I was moving up through working in fraternity and sorority life, working in student conduct. Um, and then seeing that this program was available, we actually approached this and built it into our application for funding through uh, the Category B funding. So this was something that we had intended to do uh, right from the start. Um, and to be very honest, we had one, one, one college that was already a part of the program and it was not a hard sell to the other colleges and universities to get them to participate. And so, we have offered to the colleges in Rhode Island that we'll pay for two colleges a year uh, over the five years of RPE to uh, participate in this. And so um, right now we have one, two, we have our fourth college. Uh, we have two colleges in cohort three. Cohort three or four? We have one in... You got two and three? 
This is where the years all start to blend together. We, I know. we had URI, yeah. University of Rhode Island, <laughs> and Providence. Providence College, and now we have Roger Williams University right. and Southern Virginia University. So, and they're both in four. Um, yeah. 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 So, um, and so we have funding built in to have um, two more colleges each year uh, through the rest of um, this funding cycle. Um, for all, it gives an opportunity for all of our colleges to participate in this. I think we're lucky we have. Um, our own co uh, college sexual violence collaborative, which they all participate in, and really they're selling it to each other, and so th they have the opportunity to talk to each other. Uh, just yesterday, or pardon me, on Thursday, they were all talking uh, about the program together uh, and having that conversation. Uh, and so that's good that we have this real organic uh, group that's willing to have this conversation because we meet monthly, and so they're like, "Hey, what are you guys doing in, in cultural sex?" So. Um, it's helpful in that sense that they can talk to each other about their experience in doing that. Um, and as this goes along, they'll be able to reach out to each other uh, if they have questions or things that they may need to work on. Thank you so much, Jeff and, and Patrick for, for sharing your perspective. Um, I do wanna take a moment here because I know that um, you all, Patrick and Jeff can probably answer questions a lot better than Jennifer and I can about any of the nitty gritty um, back end pieces on how how you did that, how you, how you worked that into the funding. Um, I don't know if folks in the group have any questions for Jeff and Patrick about that piece of it, um, but um, I, I certainly don't want to um, miss the opportunity to have you all share how you were able to make that work um, specifically. If folks do have questions. We just built it into our budget. <laughs> So it was, it was just a part of how we went about doing it. And so it was a part of our application. Um, and, the, and the fact that there was evaluation that was going on along the way as to uh, that NAFTA has built into this as to what each school was doing. And so that part was incredibly helpful in that we didn't have to recreate something because it was already being done. Um, and they each had something to compare the work that they were doing too. Um, and so as far as the budgeting goes, we just built it into our budget. Um, so we didn't have to worry about trying to find money or scrape up money for, for other schools. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I think Jeffrey's probably a little bit better resource on this than me since I, I took over um, the budget as already written in there. Um, but I might actually even reach out to you, Jeffrey, about the evaluation side too, because I know that's a conversation that um, Allison and Jennifer are, I were having as well. So um, I'd love to maybe pick your brain down the line, but just, I think that kind of illustrates this um, collective that it forms with us as well to reach out to each other and talk to each other on these things. So, yeah. And my experience is, is having been, having worked in higher education for 10 years before working in public health is they're doing the same work essentially that we are just not at the state, not at the state level, but within a population that they're doing the same thing. They're talking about sexual violence. They're talking about intimate partner violence. They're talking about alcohol and drugs and tobacco and talking about food, nutrition. And, and there's so many things about what happens in, in, at a college and university at, the, at a smaller level that it just makes sense. And, and why not reach out to folks who are experts at their community level of doing these types of programs and where we at the state level can just look at this and say, okay, so how can we take this and, and allow other colleges and universities to engage in this opportunity in a smaller state like ours it, it may be that it's easier that i can get the whole state covered in five years but in other states there may be opportunities whether you work in a system if you're in pennsylvania say i'm going to pick the penn state system i'm going to pick the state college system or something like that where you figure out what's going to work for you us we're, we're including privates as well because we want our private institutions to have the same opportunities and I think it's, uh, from what you all are saying, I think it's also important to outline that these schools are doing this willingly. So it, it is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this on when we talk about next steps, but it's absolutely, it's, if, a, if the school, if the institution is open to doing this work, then we're going to work with them to do this work. Um, and I think so far we, we've had good success in that and people have been very open to it because we're not here to add work to anybody's plate. We're here, I, my job is to take some of that work off their plate. While the evaluation can be probably the heaviest part of this process as well as developing that IIP, 
but that's just because we're putting it on paper. It's stuff that our schools already want to do. Um, outside of that, it's not creating all of these checklists and to-do list items that folks who are engaging have to take part in. It's helping them do this work in an easier way and in a way that's informed by all of this research so that hopefully, and from the data we have, they can make a greater impact. So if you all do still have questions, please either speak up or feel free to um, message in the chat. But just to look at next steps, um, so I'll send a follow-up email with some materials and um, as well as the a link to the PowerPoint slides and to the presentation. I'm hoping to schedule follow-up meetings with folks just to check in. I'd love to meet. Heck, if I can meet all 50 of you, that would be amazing. I know that may not be necessarily possible because you all are busy, um, but even if it's not about the collective and that work, I'm curious to hear how things are going in your state regarding this work because it's important to us, like I said, that mission. And so if there are things that we can do to support you all in this work, again, outside of joining the collective, it's not about, um, you buying something or it's not about being a sales call it's about making those connections um, particularly if there's a school who joins on their own and it may be helpful for them to connect with you and the rpe program and then we encourage institutions to hold spots um, and for you all to hold spots in cohort five so if you all would like you can go ahead and either contact us or fill out the application um, I guess no contact us and we can talk about filling out the application for the institutions in particular. Um, our cohort sizes vary a little bit year by year, um, but I think the largest we've had, Ali, correct me if I'm wrong, was at 30? Yeah. The applications are due from institutions November 2nd. We recognize that your deadlines and your timelines are very different. So that's part of why we wanted to connect with you all in a different way so that if this is something you want to do, we can help you in working it into your budget. And then we can do some of that, um, do that outreach and do that like work and talking to institutions about whether this is something that they want to take part in. And then the cohort, the fifth cohort will launch in January 2020. 2021. For me, <laughs> oh, 2021, yes, I totally messed up the date. It still feels like 2019 to me. I know. I'm sorry. It's been the weirdest <laughs> year, and I'm sure, I'm sure you can understand. That's oh, and I see Jeff mentioned that billing can take place after the notice of award. Okay. Yes. Yes, that's what we do with. Cool. So does anybody have any questions? We did have a question earlier on in the chat about the um, the cost of participating, um, and so I'm happy to run run through that. Oh, so put that in there. Yeah, no worries. So um, we um, the generally the the cost is um, eight thousand eight hundred and ninety five dollars per institution. Um, we that is generally the the NASPA member price. The institution is. Um, Quite a bit higher if you're a NASPA non-member, but I will say, kind of just just here in this space, that um, we've been able to be um, super flexible, um, especially with the RPE program. That you know, if we know, um, like the state of Montana, you know, was was bringing, um, I think, five institutions into that first cohort, or it might have been been more, um, that we were able to. Um, offer them all the mem the NASPA member price, even if they weren't NASPA members, not every institution was, but um, in recognition that, you know, there was just a whole chunk of schools coming, coming in from Montana, we wanted to be um, as flexible as we could. And um, I would just say that just generally speaking, um, we try to be as flexible as we can with everything. I know we've had conversations with, um, with Jeff about, you know, when's the right time for the invoice to hit so that it aligns with the billing cycle, or excuse me, with the invoicing cycle for, for you all on the RPE side. So um, just know that whatever um, barrier there may be or a challenge that you might anticipate, um, we can, you know, almost invariably find a creative solution to make it work, so just wanted to let y'all know that. All right, well, we can leave the chat open for another minute or two in case folks do have um, other, other questions for us. 
happy to answer those. Happy to put you in touch with folks at these institutions if you want to um, hear from them directly. And thank you to, to Jeff and Patrick who have graciously added their information here. I know you all must be swamped on your ends with everything that you have going on on all the different sides of things. So I'm sure thinking as far out as November and a November deadline is not <laughs> easy, but as we all know, time has kind of lost all meaning during these last couple months. So it'll probably be here before we know it. I'll give folks one more minute or so in case they do have any questions. And thank you to those of you who um, pop them um, into the private chat. And hopefully I, Jennifer and I were able to answer all of those. All right, well, um, you have our information there on the slide. If you do want to get in touch with us, um, as, um, as Jennifer noted, we are happy to speak one-on-one um, -on -one and um, talk a little bit about your specific state and um, your needs. So please do feel free to reach out. We look forward to connecting with so many of you. All right, thanks everybody.